PWC. Uh, we're going to kind of bounce off really quick on these, and I'll spend a little more time on this system management. It's probably the most interesting. So strategy and transformation, what I'm aligned to right now, and it's uh, we go into companies and we look at what are what are they doing well, what are their gaps, where are they trying to go, and, and we pick out the most important things and we make a plan for how to move forward and how to improve their security needs. Uh, privacy and consumer protection is another area that we have. A lot of people uh, have recently been focusing on the GDPR stuff and, and privacy and compliance. Um, that one's really big on um, companies usually don't care about their client's information and protecting it, but with all the different applications and, and servers they have, it, it can be complicated to, to figure out where all that stuff is stored. So our privacy and consumer protection group helps identify and secure the information. Yeah. So incident threat management, uh, that's where I sit at PwC. So there's kind of a couple different teams under ITM. The first is our incident response team. So those are the people who get the call when a company has a breach. When I say company, we have fortunately my mother company. And we're on a plane within a few hours going to deal with the situation not only technically, so figuring out where the threat actor is in the network. What are they doing? But we also want to know what type of data was accessed. Are there regulations like HIPAA uh, that we have to be compliant with as far as disclosing the breach in the appropriate timeline? Um, but also dealing with the PR and the actual business side is, you know, it is, it is a crisis in the business. You have to set up uh, almost a command structure like you would see in the military uh, to deal with that and make decisions. Otherwise, you know, nothing will get done. And we've seen incidents in the past that are been public that really weren't handled very well. And, that leads to a lot of negative PR about the company when they wait two or three months to say, oh, this breach happened 10 years ago and we're just learning about it now. So really that's an important part of what we do on these response projects is it's not just the technical side, but also dealing with how we communicate this to our customers. Uh, the other side of that team is our cyber penetration testing team. So we do all sorts of different pen testing, uh, internal pen tests, external, physical, uh, red team, so that's kind of uh, a more advanced style pen test. It usually starts with spear phishing, but technically, uh, in most cases, there's nothing off the table. Uh, that's one you guys probably saw that in the news recently. There were some guys that got arrested during a physical pen test in Iowa. So obviously, we're going to be very careful when we're doing physical pen testing. Those types of things, but we do uh, execute those types of engagements. Uh, pro tip there: if you're doing one, make sure you have your good jail pre card, and also make sure that it's actually valid. Um, there's also some other people in this group uh, around readiness, you know, having a plan to deal with incidents, um, having uh, the right procedures and processes in your security operations center. Uh, and then I think the other area to call out is our specialized testing. Things like web applications, uh, mobile apps, Internet of Things. Uh, we did an IoT assessment and you know, all sorts of findings left and right, but I think the one the executives were the most scared about was that we could tap their phone conversations because they weren't using the encryption deployment protocols. So you might think, oh, that's kind of just a, you know, we can do this with our voice and those types of things. But from an executive, that's more important to them than that, you know, their camera has an RC. Uh, implementation and operations, uh, another area where there's a lot of very technical things going on. And this is implementing just about any technology that has to do with security. So anything from privilege access management, knowing what passwords are used where, rotating those passwords on like an hourly or daily or weekly basis, um, and making sure when someone checks out a privileged account in the enterprise, checks it back in, that that credential is rotated so that if it was compromised during its use, it's no longer in order. But also things like identity access management, who has access when and where, and make sure we revoke it when we're done. Uh, and then the final area of closer cyber services, that's basically when we're going to help a company out with uh, certain needs, so maybe triaging phishing emails and their security operations center. It's a good offer, uh, option there where it's kind of repetitive tasks and it's really hard to find or retain talent for that. So that's an option for the first model. Um, so enough about PwC in general. Let's talk about our pen test team. That's what you guys probably want to hear about. Uh, you can go on the sure. So we'll start spear phishing, which is a good way to get a foothold in the system. Um, spear phishing is a, a type of phishing attack where you target 
uh, really important people that you think will get you a, a good position in their company. So we, we go on the internet, we look up maybe their social media, their LinkedIn uh, to get more information that we can customize our, our uh, spear phishing emails to get them to actually react. Yeah, and I think this goes right along with the next one, which is the custom remote access tools. When we're spear phishing, we're going to target someone who it makes sense for them to get external email and external attachments. A lot of our payloads are delivered through things like office macros, uh, our browser extensions, uh, trying to get people to go to a site and download something. Um, but it's a lot easier to send a Word document to someone who does recruiting for a company than it is to an IT person, more likely to be caught. Um, customer remote access tools, we write our own. We use some publicly available ones, a tool called uh, Cobalt Strike, you guys might have seen. That some of our engagements, but we're actually moving towards a, a full in house build solution because uh, it, it just starts to get caught more and more with some of the more advanced tools out there. Browser exploits uh, will we'll craft websites that are targeted that have uh, the same theme with whatever we're spear phishing with, and uh, we'll, in, in those emails, lure them to these sites to, to click on them and, and attack them via browser. Yeah, we don't see this one too often, but we've done ones where we're trying to get people to install plugins or browser extensions in the past. Uh, and then we've also seen, you know, if you look at what's happening in the industry, things like the Zoom exploit that recently happened, where if you're on a Mac, you would go to a page and suddenly Zoom starts doing things on your computer. Uh, so those are still kind of real things that happen. Uh, USB drive drops, so actually going to the client's parking lots, dropping drives in the, on the ground and say something like, you know, financial year bonuses or executive salaries, things that people are more likely to open. Or if we're doing a physical fund test, we might combine this and leave drives on people's desks. Because it's more likely if you get a drive on your desk at work, if you can open it, probably. If you see one in the parking lot, maybe you turn it into security. So really try to tie these different areas together. Social engineering, uh, we get a list of, of people and, and phone numbers and try and call them. And we usually bundle this with either browser exploits or the, uh, your phishing emails and uh, I did a social engineering engagement where I got on the phone with one woman and um, told her that I was with a company just collecting data on like how the company was doing and like give us feedback and she just laid into the company about all these things they were doing wrong and all these technical things that they should be fixing. Yeah, it was almost like a, a, a survey of, like tell us your complaints about your computer at work. Imagine the number of things that you could rant about and still the things on at the same time. Uh, external infrastructure, we don't want to discount this when we're doing a red team. Uh, stuff that you've got hosted on the internet can be vulnerable. We've seen a lot of breaches recently where they got in through the external infrastructure, be it Citrix, be it Equifax, um, be it even Capital One in a weird kind of way. Uh, so we'll take a look at that when we're doing a red team, but it's not the only way in. Physical security, you already mentioned the uh, engagement that happened in Iowa with another company that didn't go so well. Um, we make sure that the, the scope is really detailed and, and we'll have different objectives, whether it's just to, to get into the building and do this tailgating or um, it's to get to a certain spot in the company. Um, we don't have as strict rules. We'll, we'll try to go find a conference room and, and hop on a, an open port there. Yeah, another thing we like to do is clone people's badges, use those big RFID readers, clone a badge, and use something like the Proxmark to write our own badge. Um, we've had ones where we bought ladders and climbed over some buildings, uh, to get through open hatches, and uh, we did have one actually where like we were breaking into a chemical plant, and that's one of those ones where we were told basically the moment you get through the door, you stop, you call security because it's not safe for you to be in there. So it's that's a tricky one, but uh, it's a lot of fun when you do it if you can get in. And then the, the last one is mass phishing. So the difference with spear phishing here is we're sending to maybe 50 to 100 people instead of two or three. We usually try to harvest credentials here to then potentially use to a, a non-two-factor service that's public or just to gain emails to do uh, for further attacks with. This one here is nice to do things like clone the company's brand, their fonts, their logos, use a similar sounding domain. 
So all these things are different techniques that we'll employ on our red team for event test engagement. And a lot of times we'll work with our clients to figure out what they're concerned about and what we do on engagement. We usually would not do them all at the same time. Uh, we just have an order to them or what they want to see. So I'm going to kind of switch gears here to a pen test that I did recently. Um, this was, I'll call it an advanced pen test, so a little bit longer than our typical scope. But the part I'm covering here, the time frame, just so you guys can kind of gate that, was about a week uh, from us getting plugged into the network to getting the access that we were able to get. So we actually built this diagram for the client, so it's going to be really useful here. Obviously, it's sanitized. Um, and I will say right now, if you guys get lost throughout this, like, throw your hand up or, like, shout out, because there's some really technical stuff in here, even for me. Uh, and I want to make sure you guys are following along, and I'm not just rambling up here with nobody. So the first thing we did, uh, this was an internal pen test, so we did have someone let us in the front door and walk us to a conference room. Uh, and in this case, it was prearranged for this client based on our previous experience to actually whitelist us from their network access control. Uh, they had 802.11.1x, which is where you have to have certificates to authenticate to the switch. And uh, we knew that there were certain bypasses that they were vulnerable to, uh, but for the sake of us testing and not being kicked off the network kind of on our regular basis, uh, they did not list us, but that was the only thing that they gave us. Everything else that we did from here on was of our own doing without any of their help. No credentials or anything like that were given to us. Uh, so the first attack we did is something we call mouse jacking. Uh, so how many of you have those Logitech unifying receivers in your laptops, like a little orange circle on them? Uh, until very, very recently, those were actually vulnerable to keystroke injection. So what I can do is take something like the Crazy Radio PA, uh, get it on Amazon, Flash a custom firmware on it and start injecting keystrokes, and you'll start seeing you know, if I was being nice, a calico pop up on your computer. If I'm not being so nice, uh, you're still going to be into my C2 server. Uh, so, in this case, uh, we're, we're in Windows for all of this network, and one of the things that we want to try to do is get our first set of credentials, our first password that we can use to move through the network. Uh, so, on that user device, we are able to inject some credentials. Windows key run, open command prompt, hide it right away, and then start typing in uh, the net commands to mount a file share. What this is going to do when we use an IP address is we'll attempt a at NetMTM v2 authentication. So that is a, uh, it's kind of like a challenge and response authentication with some hashes involved. And because we're the device on the other side, we can preset some of those conditions so we know what they are. Um, this is a hash you can't use right away. You have to run it through a password cracker. Uh, so in this case, we have a bunch of servers with GTX graphics cards in them. Uh, maybe I think the biggest box we have is eight graphics cards. And in a couple of hours, you can come back with the clear text for most passwords. So in this case, we had our low-level user. We'll call them user one. They're just a normal user on the network. They don't have any special permissions. As far as we know, they're just a domain user. You've used Active Directory before. So why do we want this low-level user? Well, <coughs> we never want to start with the the highest goal, we want to start slow and not get ourselves caught right away. If this account were to be compromised, we could just redo the attack against somebody else's computer or find another way to get that initial level access. So how many of you here have played with Active Directory or set it up? A couple, awesome. So in Active Directory, the, the domain user group actually gives you a lot of access. Uh, you can read attributes about every account in the group, the membership, systems that are joined, the services that might be running on them as that regular low-level user using the default Microsoft ACLs that they uh, get you. So what does this allow us to do? We can do reconnaissance around a lot of things without ever having to run a network scan or compromise the system. So we're just going to talk straight LDAP to Active Directory and do queries around, hey, here's this user, they're in this group, what's the description on it, what's the manager, those types of things. Try to find systems to target or the enterprise. And like I said, you know, we don't have the ports can't find things. Um, there's a thing called service principal names, which is a Microsoft thing with Kerberos. But essentially, anytime there's a service running a certain way on a Windows system, it'll say, hey, this is a SQL service running on port 1433 or whatever it might be. So we can get that kind of information, that level of detail, without ever having to start <coughs> or be able to talk to the system. So we can do our reconnaissance now. Uh, now we want to actually compromise the system and escalate our privileges we have a low-level account, how can we get it for a bit? Uh, the first thing we like to do is go after a workstation administrator. There's usually a role that's kind of delegated out from the main administrator in most enterprises to help desk people have kind of access. 
people who are configuring systems, uh, making changes, that type of thing. And a lot of times we'll see SCCM, which is the System Center Configuration Manager, which is Microsoft's tool to push patches for Windows. Um, it usually, for whatever reason, will have a lot of access across workstations. It doesn't actually need to have it, but we see it a lot. So uh, we did a little bit of reconnaissance here, looked in Active Directory and some policy, and found, hey, there is this account, this SCCM SQL account, that seems to have quite a lot of privilege across workstations. So uh, what we're going to do now uh, is we need to get access to one of these systems so it can steal <coughs> And the way we're going to do that is we're going to do some reconnaissance around these SCCM servers. And one thing we can do as a domain user is ask another server, hey, who's a member of your local administrator's group? Uh, until very recently, that could be done by any user in the domain. Uh, with like server 2019, 2016, you have to already be an administrator to make that query. Uh, but by default, in older versions of Windows, it's not the case. So I was able to find uh, users and accounts and groups in Active Directory that had local administrative access on the system. And surprisingly, one of the systems that had access to this database server was this other system called SCCM1. Uh, so in Active Directory, you have users, but you also have what are called machine accounts. And that's how your computer gets things like your policy updates, uh, downloads files when there's no one logged in. Uh, the machines actually have a password. It's like a 25-character randomly password that's changed every month by Active Directory. But those are just as good um, to authenticate new services like Kerberos. In this case, that SCCM1 system, through a couple of nested groups, was an administrator on this SCCM database server. So now we have a potential way to get in. We have another account that leads to the account we're originally trying to get. How do we actually get in? How do we do this? We're going to do what's called an NTLM relay. Uh, so there's a cool set of tools out there called Impacket. It's on GitHub. It's all written in Python. It's basically Linux ways of interacting with Windows services. The one reason here is called NTLM Relay X. It does NTLM Relay. Uh, so the reason we can do this relay is by default in a lot of Windows services and systems, this thing called SMB signing is turning off. And SMB signing is basically saying we're going to sign this packet so you can't forge the source or destination, just like we see in a lot of other protocols, web protocols and such. Uh, it's turned off for a lot of reasons, mainly due to legacy systems. But it was not turned on in these systems, so it's great for us. It means that we can forge sources and destinations and kind of do what we want with these packets as they're flowing. Um, so now we have a way of relaying this authentication. How do we actually get the authentication to start? How do we get SCCM1 to authenticate to our testing laptop so we can then relay that authentication to the database server? We're going to use uh, what Microsoft doesn't say is a vulnerability, but I kind of think it is. Uh, flaw in one of their default services is the Microsoft Remote, Remote Printing Service or MSRPN. And that's used for like print servers on Windows systems. And there's this functionality where as a device I can request to the server to check another remote server if there's any print jobs available and pull them back to that server. And that authentication is done with the machines or the computer's machine account. So we can submit a request uh, using this cooler sample uh, tool. It's again another open source tool on GitHub. And we can say, hey, uh, SCCM1, can you actually check my testing laptop for print jobs? And we're just going to grab that NTLM authentication that happens and relay it to that database server. Um, so now we have the method of actually getting something to happen. And we'll actually use this technique again, so that's why I spent so much time on it. Um, so at this point, we now. Uh, when NTL Relay X gets access to a system, it's going to dump the local hashes on the system, specifically the RAID 500 or the built-in administrator account that you see whenever you set up a Windows server. It's that first administrator that you see. So we have its NTL hash, and we're going to do two additional things here with that hash to get what we need. Uh, we're going to do something called pass the hash, which means that we don't actually have to obtain the clear text password. We can just use the NTL hash. So there's a couple of hashes I've talked about here. There's NetNTLM, which is a, both a hash and an authentication protocol. So there's challenge response, kind of like salting if you think about uh, databases and web apps. Uh, whereas NTLM hashes is just the password hash. And Windows actually will let you authenticate the services with that. Uh, so we've stolen this hash. We can pass the hash and use a tool called Secret Stuff. What Secret Stuff does in this case is extracting secrets out of the registry. 
specifically uh, what service account different things are configured to run in. So Microsoft SQL is running on this system, and it's set to run as this STM SQL user. So that value is in the registry, it's encrypted, but the, encrypt, the key to encrypt is also in the registry. So we can pull both values, we can decrypt it on our local system. So that's a whole bunch of stuff. What does that actually give us? That gives us the clear text password for SCCM SQL, which gives us workstation admin across the entire environment. So pretty good, went down a path here around stealing credentials from developers and trying to get into some services. Ended up not being very useful, but um, there's the slide I was going to talk about this. Um, <laughs> and uh, eventually kind of that was a dead end. The incident response team did catch on to us using that account a little bit. So we kind of said, you know what, we're just going to kind of put that on hold for a minute and uh, move on from there. So is everyone following so far as to what we've done? We now have workstation administrator in the enterprise. Awesome. So we're going to keep going. We like this uh, print schooler attack that we've been doing. Let's see how far it'll take us. We like to reuse things as well on engagements because it's less <coughs> IOCs that we're leaving for our clients to discover and you know less techniques that we're potentially burning with them. Um, so we want to compromise active directory. That's our goal for this phase of that test. And a way that came out very recently, probably in the past time we do that, is by using something called Kerberos unconstrained shell. So here is sort of Kerberos. Awesome. So a lot of people who here knows what unconstrained delegation is. No. Awesome. So let's talk about that. So in Kerberos, everything is signed by default, right? Unlike what we're talking about with Samba and SMB, where there's not signing and all this stuff, it's signed, it's certificates uh, and, and such. So Say I have a device where a user is going to log into a web server, and then that web server needs to do something on behalf of the user. In some cases, we use the server, or the service account in this case, but maybe the system or database they're connected to is high security or can't be configured to work that way, or we really want to see the user's account log in all the way through. Uh, so Microsoft's first attempt to solve this problem is called the Kerberos double hop issue. Um, and, and the reason why it's an issue is the web server, if we're to take the Kerberos ticket, but gave it, it wouldn't be valid coming from the web server. It would say, hey, the, the whole source of this is not right. This isn't going to work. Uh, so Microsoft said, hey, we're going to invent this crazy awesome thing called unconstrained delegation, where if a system is marked with a special flag, the essentially the source field of the Kerberos ticket doesn't matter. It can be used from anywhere in the network. So a couple of you probably realized the issue with that. Um, so they did actually come up with something called constrained delegation in the future, but of course, like as a system with large networks, there's always going to be one or two of these lying around, and that's what we're going to go after. So, back to our servers here. App Server 1, in this case, is configured for unconstrained delegation, which means any Kerberos authentication that occurs to that system, the ticket can be used from any source system. So we can steal it and use it. Uh, same thing as we saw before with the SCCM systems. App Server 2 is a local administrator on App Server 1. So we're going to do the exact same thing where we're going to relay from App Server 2 to our testing laptop into App Server 1 and get it local rate by 100 hash. And then we're going to use a tool called Rubius. This is a pretty new tool that uh, came out recently on GitHub. You guys want to check it out. Um, and its goal is to be able to do kind of malicious or evil things with Kerberos, especially in an active directory environment. And we're going to tell uh, Rubius while it's running on this system hey, can you just monitor for incoming Kerberos authentications and kindly dump those Kerberos tickets and basic support to the console for me so I can use them later. Um, so that's what's set up and running. What are we going to do now? We are going to steal the machine account of the domain controller. Uh, the domain controller is where all the secrets and goodness are on the network, um, and we want to be able to steal and get access to it. Um, some of you might be wondering, well, why didn't you just do the same thing you did before with the SAP relay and all that? Good. Well, it turns out Microsoft was at least a little bit smart. Domain controllers enforce SMB signing type default. Nothing else does, but domain controllers do. So we can't use SMB relays in this case. We have to steal the Kerberos ticket. But our good old Prince Booler does work. So we're going to, this time, instead of saying, hey, can you check my testing laptop for new print jobs? We're going to say, hey, can you check the FQDN of this app server for print jobs? The reason why we're using the FQDN or the fully qualified domain name is Kerberos only works with DNS. If you try to use an IP address with Kerberos, it's going to authorize NTLL instead, and then nothing's going to work for us. So we do our same attack. 
we run our spooler sample uh, on our laptop and say, hey, check out server one. And lo and behold, Rubius comes back with a Kerberos ticket for the machine account of this domain controller. Uh, why do we want that machine account? Well, the machine account is an administrator in itself. And as long as we have local administrator access or that uh, built-in administrator role, rather, on a domain controller, we can get access to the Active Directory database, which is all our, where all the password caches are stored. So we're going to do just that. We have our Kerberos ticket. We're going to, on our testing laptop, load it into Mimikatz, and we're going to say, hey, go ahead and do a DC sync. Who knows what DC sync is? One or two? Awesome. So there's some awesome DEF CON talks out there from a few years ago. If you follow this kind of saga of Windows pen testing, and Mimikatz is one of the first tools that kind of had a lot of popularity in this space. Uh, and DC sync, the attack itself, is uh, based on what domain controllers do normally. So you have more than one domain controller in a network, and they replicate with each other all the time. You reset your password, the change gets replicated backwards and forwards. And more importantly, if I add a new domain controller to the network, a DC promo wizard, if you've ever created a domain or added another system, you have to give it your credentials, you have to say like what the DNS sector is going to be, all that good stuff. It actually does this synchronization in the background. It's a set of Microsoft APIs uh, that get called. So what we're going to do with Minicast is say, is say, hey, Mr. Domain Controller, I'm a new domain controller. Can you please replicate the whole database to me? And because we're authenticating as a Molten administrator, it's going to say, sounds good. You have replication rights. Here you go. So now in this case, at this point, we have compromised the domain. And what I mean by compromise, we have the NTLM hashes, or the, the password hashes that we can pass or crack of all the domain users. And we also have the Kerberos signing key. So we can forge our own Kerberos tickets at this point, it's called a golden ticket attack. Or we can take these passwords offline from our password crackers, crack the clear text, and now we can impersonate end user that we're able to crack the password. So that's the whole domain compromise. That's what I wanted to walk you guys through. Uh, we did go out on this pen test to target some uh, objectives. So this was a PCI pen test, so credit card data. So we did actually eventually get access to their PCI systems, um, along with some other things, critical services in the environment. So the reason I bring that up is, while it might sound scary to compromise the domain to someone who works in IT, if I tell them exactly that I compromised Active Directory, they're going to be, what? Come on, directories, huh? But if I tell them we got access to your credit cards, they're going to say, ah, that's yeah. <laughs> So uh, that's kind of the key important piece, is, is that final steps of giving access to that sensitive data that's crown jewels. And then in some cases, also exfiltrating that data or mock representations of that data from the network uh, to a system that we control. So I know it's a lot of uh, information, but does anyone have any questions about that debrief? Yes? How long did you say all this took? This took about a week. Two resources on a week. Other questions? Questions about what PwC does in general as far as pen testing? Yes. How much training did you need to do all that? Like, how long did it take yeah. you to get into that? So, I've been dedicated pen testing on our team for about a year and a half now. So, probably, I did this test. I've been executing for over a year on our team. So, that's kind of on-the-job training. And then, we also offer internal training courses as well for our staff. Uh, so, probably about a week or two weeks worth of training as far as actual classroom time. You also have to have some kind of base knowledge of Active Directory and Windows. Uh, but that's, um, it's important, but you know, you can learn that stuff as you go as you learn the tech. You know. Yeah, a lot of the stuff comes from just like what we see online, what researchers are doing, open source tools, and how, how can we take these things that we see and put them together and piece together a chain or a tech path that works. Yeah. So does that, um what you talked about today didn't seem to involve hardly any coding. Does pen testing in general involve a lot of coding? Or? Um, I'd say that we, we definitely do a lot of coding on our team, but it's not a hard requirement that you are like the most awesomest coder ever. Um, in this case, we had to compile some existing source code, make a few changes here and there, uh, but it was mainly just updating some string values, for example. Um, but we have people on our team who are, are writing malware in whatever language we might pick, be it targeting a Linux system, a Mac system, or a Linux PC. So there's definitely kind of both sides of that, but it is not a requirement to be a awesome coder. Does that answer your question? 
Yes. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. Is this workflow fairly typical for most of the you know, Active Directory environment pen tests, or is this? This one I'd say is probably a little bit on the harder side, comparatively speaking. Uh, we have a set of techniques, I think I went over this last year at ISG, um, which is an attack we call Responder Curve Arrest. And it's a really quick attack where, similar to this first step we did where we get those uh, low level credentials, we can do something similar, but instead of injecting keystrokes, we can trick systems to authenticate to us. Uh, in that case, we're using uh, NetBIOS name service and link layer and multicast name resolution. The two layer two protocols that essentially if we can beat the response or if there is no response, we can say, oh, you're looking for old file server, I'm old file server, authenticate to me. Uh, so same kind of concept of getting that first initial low level access. The curve roasting is something I recommend you go out and look at. It's been, uh, there's several DEF CON talks about it. Uh, it uses those service principal names and the fact that you can request them using RC4 encryption, which is super easy to crack at this point. In that case, it's uh, the coolest part, uh, probably the coolest pen test I've done is where we jump straight to the domain administrator because the domain administrator has a service principal name set and we can pass for it. Other questions? Yes? How easy is it to transition into other positions or to get experience cross training? And At PWC? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, it's very rare that someone comes directly onto our pen testing team. You know, like I said, there's a lot of training that has to happen ahead of time. Um, yeah, so we actually have another internal training course that we offer for people who are already staffed at PwC and our different lines of service. You know, back to that initial slide I had where there's those five dimensions. Uh, and we pull people in all the time from those other areas onto our pen test team. And the, the way we do it right now, it's about a two or three year rotation. You can stay longer if you want to, but you don't have to. But it's kind of the expectation that you work with the team for a couple of years because there is a decent amount of training and investment involved. But once you're done, if you want to go back to a different line of service or work on different types of projects, uh, usually project teams would be very happy to have a pen tester uh, <laughs> along their midst so they can answer those technical questions and understand you know, what are all these findings, how do we remediate them. And we're trying to get better at that as a team. And so I mentioned purple teaming. That's where we actually go and work with the client's security operations center and say, hey, we just did all these crazy attacks. How do we detect them? How do we make your tools better? How do you train your incident response team as well? So there's a lot of not only technical, but also people in processing that as well. Um, so it's definitely a lot of opportunity to move between. And you know, you're not set or hired to do exactly one thing. You can move around with that being said, if you want to find test and that's like all you want to do, that's totally an option as well. Yes? So if I wanted to be an intern for PwC, uh, what roles and responsibilities would I have as an intern? And also, when, where should I sign up? That's a wonderful question. It's almost like I have a slide ready for you. Uh, so if you have interest about PwC in general, pwc.com slash campus, if you want to apply to be an intern for this upcoming summer, pwc.2 slash entry level jobs, that position application slot thing closes tonight at 11 p.m. So get your applications in the moment you go home. Um, and then we're also going to be at the fall CDC, like I said. Now, as far as roles and responsibilities, um, as an intern, it's going to depend on the type of pen test and the kind of risk involved. Um, guaranteed, if you're interning with my team, you'll be shadowing engagements and learn exactly what's going on. I have also taken interns uh, on internal pen tests with me uh, and kind of uh, Watch you through and actually how you execute uh, on the test. So it really comes down to, to how sensitive the environment you're working in is. But I definitely want to make sure that people have hands on experience and are actually doing security testing. By no means are you getting coffee for the team or anything dumb like that. Like you are executing and we are using your technical skills and knowledge to test our hard clients. Yes? So I just. Uh got uh, obtained a job with the state of Iowa doing monitoring. What if after graduation, um, well, that's not going to land into a permanent job. Is it still possible after graduation to do an internship with your company? Do you have to do an internship before getting hired or what's so, the process? Yeah, I'll kind of walk you through the, the general flow of things and I'll, I'll caveat this all saying there's always room for exception. If you're an awesome resource and we want you on our team, we'll figure out a way to make that being said, the typical path 
is that you'll intern the, uh, the summer before you graduate. Uh, and then you can either start with us in uh, January, February time frame or in the August time frame. So typically we do convert a lot of our interns to full times. That being said, I did not actually intern with the PCP. I went direct full time. So that's an option to do that as well. It's definitely a smaller percentage of people, but don't rule that out. And they're always looking for experience hours as well. So if you, say, for example, take that position, and then maybe in two, three years, if you have some experience, say, you know what, I want to do something different. I want to consult. I want to help uh, you know, outside the state of Iowa. I want to travel a lot, for example. We're definitely looking for experience hires as well. And those positions are always open online. Yes? Kind of go back to the, uh, almost the beginning of the the Dallas County thing. I know those guys actually did have like their yeah they don't free card see that yeah. most of their ducks in a row and still got it. I agree, yeah. And so it's an interesting thing. We we did take a look at the contracts, they were published online. Uh, this is my personal opinion, by the way, that the contracts were a little bit lengthy and had some conflicting language around testing windows and authorized activities. Um, so for example, I think there was something around like they weren't allowed to tamper with alarms. Um, so it's you know unclear if they were tampering with alarm and that's what got them caught, or they just happened to sit on the sensor. Uh, I think the other thing too, and you know, we don't usually do work for state governments, uh, and that is just really complicated and complex to do. Um, but we have seen this with our other clients, where say it's a parent company that's authorizing a pen test of a child company. Uh, we do want to make sure that we have all the right people on board, and we've gone through all the kind of legal. Uh, that we don't put ourselves in that situation where you know, we, have, we have to hire someone else down at our door or we have people getting arrested. So again, personal opinion in that case, you know, it's a local county versus state kind of thing, and I'm sure that'll get worked out eventually, but um, you know, it, it is a reality. That's why we have to be very careful about things like you know, not using any of these tools and systems that we want the approval to use them on, and making sure we have signed contracts before we start the pen test. So yeah, that's a good point that there's, you know, there is a little bit of risk here, but if you do it right, and you know, our team has been doing this for quite a long time, you know, we've never had any problems or anything like what the, that team had. Yes? Sorry. No worries, you, you have really good questions <laughs> that kind of answer for the whole room. So, um, you have specific locations. Yes. Uh, what if somebody lives in a different state than a location? Do you guys allow them to working after so long? Or? So, uh, we typically don't have 100% remote workers. Okay. Um, you know, that being said, uh, so we both work in the Minneapolis office. We have people that live you know, 100 miles away. Mm -hmm. you, know, you aren't required to come into the office every single day. But you are required to be able to get to your client site or work on your engagement. So uh, on a pen test, a lot of the work can be done remotely. You know, yeah. If it's cold out and snowing outside, that's bet I'm working from home. But yeah, even if it's the summer, I want to work from home, I can. But if I need to be on site for an internal or physical pen test, I need to be able to get there, fly there usually. I want to live near an airport, and you know, if you're near a small airport, that might be connecting. Um, so there's always exceptions to it. That being said, I would also say that there is a PwC office in just about every medium-sized and larger city in the United States. Um, we have an office in Des Moines. There's not much uh, cybersecurity in Des Moines, but there is an office there. Um, in every other kind of big city or medium sized city. Yeah. So you don't have one in Idaho, and that's like my goal state. <laughs> like, yeah, I don't, I don't think we have one in Idaho. Um, we'll have it in Seattle, though. Yep, yeah, Seattle, um, I would guess Portland, uh, San Francisco. So, you know, there's flexibility there too, especially, okay. you know, if you're with the firm for a while and you want to move further out, you know, that's a conversation you have with your call our uh, relationship leaders uh, and say, hey, like, I want to move further away, is this all right? And I think really it comes down to, can you still execute on projects and serve our clients? And usually it's probably up to the issue. But to your probably original ask, we don't have fully remote work. So, that other questions? Yes? Can you a technical question? Sure. You're mentioning a lot about just using like uh, NT alarm caches, yes. and, like catching those, which I know are pretty easy to break. Um, have you ever come across like networks that have that disabled? Um, have an NT alarm disabled? Completely? Yeah, and uh, is that <coughs> I'm assuming it's a lot harder to do anything with? Yeah. Hash the hash. Pass the hash still work? 
Uh, so past the hash is using NGL authentication, so most of that's probably going to fall uh, and not be possible. That being said, unless it's a full Linux environment, I have never seen NGL authentication disabled in the three years that I've been doing this, and I'm going to speak for the rest of my team say so you've probably never seen that. Um, in the networks and companies we're dealing with, they're so large and complex, and they've been around, you know, I've seen domains that started with Windows 2000, yeah, and they're still going. It's just been so, so, you know, still that. we see this a lot where people are really concerned or, or have a hard time disabling legacy protocols. You know, we, you know, we make recommendations, which is, hey, stop using NetOTM v1 and move to v2 because it's stronger. Or stop using LM hashes, which are even weaker than NCLM hashes. So a lot of places aren't even close to being able to turn off those types of protocols. Is there any reason? can't really move away from that that you know, uh, Legacy like systems. Uh, if you're building like from scratch, yeah, you could turn it off and only use Kerberos. Um, but in the real world, it's not going to happen. Not even Legacy, it's just, you know, someone built a system in a certain way. And, you know, say I'm in that position of a security team or a secure uh, a CISO, and I say, hey, we're turning off NTLI. If I had to take a guess in the dark, that's like a three or four year project. That's not a simple undertaking. And would it be better just to try to detect things that are going on and react to them or take the time to detect them? So there is kind of this balance of disabling things, fixing things versus, you know, in some cases, it's how can we monitor for this and hopefully push it to, to go away from this in the future? Yeah. Anyone else? Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much. We'll be up here to answer questions. There's still some pizza as well. I'm not sure if you have anything else to say. Our presentation. Oh, perfect. So, thank you guys for letting us present this all.